Good morning. Thank you for those who are starting to join us. We'll give it a couple of minutes or a minute or so for everybody to, to get online and then we'll get started. Still a few more people trickling in. This is the part where in our live workshops, we would be offering you pastries and coffee and getting to know everybody. So apologize for the lack of pastries. All right, pretty good turnout. Let's go ahead and get started. So first I wanna thank you for joining me in the Arizona Manufacturing Extension Partnership um, for our workshop today, Research and Development Tax Credits with Tony Hanep from R&D Tax Consulting. First I wanna start out by giving you a little bit of an overview of the Arizona Manufacturing Extension Partnership, kind of how we operate and how we help uh, manufacturers in the community. So our mission is to make every Arizona manufacturer the most successful business it can be. And here you can see our team on the consists of mostly advisors. Many of you may know one or more of us um, and then our lead our, our, and our office staff. So the way we're structured, we're a partially federally funded program and we're overseen by NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technologies. Here in Arizona, the Arizona Commerce Authority holds our grants. So we work operationally through the Arizona Commerce Authority and we work nicely with them. They're a very nice compliment to us and we compliment them very well. However, our, we are measured by NIST and, and the impacts that we bring to uh, the clients that we serve. And the way we're measured is through surveys. So once we do a project with you, uh, you will be sent a survey through NIST very brief 10 minutes and we ask that you fill that out as complete as possible sharing with us the impacts that we made to your business whether it's cost savings increased sales things like that all of these surveys are rolled up across the u.s from all of the mep centers across the united states and here's the impacts from last fiscal year so basically 114,000 jobs created over 15 billion in new and retained sales 1.5 billion in cost savings and 4.5 billion in new client investments. The biggest challenges that we see and that we see across the US uh, for manufacturers are cost reductions, employee recruitment, and in some cases that's, that's even higher, uh, growth and product development. And then also on that survey, you'll see it towards the end, they'll ask how we were to work with and Across the nationwide network, it's, a, it's an 85 net promoter score. Um, in Arizona, we're actually above 90. So we're very proud of that score. We like to help. That's why we do what we do. And we appreciate the feedback that we get from our clients. Now, how do we bring these impacts? We offer an array of services. With our relatively small team and our third party partners, we can bring a variety of services, including some of the ones you see here, operationally, continuous improvement, lean, staffing, 
quality certifications. Uh, in some cases, we can uncover hidden costs and, and to your, in your business and bring value immediately through inventory optimization, um, shipping service cost savings by using volume. Um, and in business, um, R&D tax credit, what we're here to talk about today, many of you probably do have hidden cash in your business that we might be able to start to unlock today. Utility tax exemptions, we help many clients um, realize that they shouldn't be paying um, state utility tax. So that's a windfall of thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars for, for some of our clients. Um, and then some of the other things you see here. So I'll introduce Tony here in just a second. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section and we'll get to them throughout the, the program. And then at the end, um, if you feel like you want to learn a little bit more or see how it's specifically related to your business, then um, just reach out to your client advisor, or if you're not sure who that is, just reach out to the Arizona MEP. Uh, we'll connect you and set up a meeting with Tony individually so that we can go over your, your specifics. So with that, I'd like to introduce Tony Hanip. Good morning. Thank you. I appreciate the, uh, the introduction, Jim. So uh, today I'll be talking uh, uh, repeatedly, uh, mentioning an R&D tax credit study. And uh, I was given the attendee list prior to, uh, uh, to kind of do some homework, learn a little bit about the companies in attendance. And uh, some of you uh, will need, I think, uh, R&D tax credit studies. Some of you won't. Uh, take an example, uh, there was a scooter company I was very interested in. I uh, just bought a scooter for my son. But um, if it's a company like that that maybe has one or two products and isn't continuously innovating, you can still claim the credit. You don't need an outside firm uh, like ours to help you with that. Uh, and what we do when we work with, uh, with, with the uh, MEP centers around the country is we're more than happy to sit down, speak with your CPA, give you some advice, give them some advice, and not charge you for this. So this is not something that you necessarily have to pay for. Uh, we don't just do this because we're nice guys. We uh, always like the opportunity to educate a CPA because they might have clients that can uh, use an R&D tax credit study. So don't think that you absolutely need an R&D tax credit study to claim the credit. Um, I will, let's see here, get into my slides. So I always start with this slide. This is kind of what uh, uh, I, I've always uh, thought of as, uh, as being uh, R&D growing up. And I think a lot of people think it's people mixing Bunsen burners, mixing uh, chemicals and such. But uh, what I hope to accomplish uh, today is to uh, uh, show the participants that uh, there's R&D qualifying activities that are pervasive through your organization. So I'll start about uh, talking about the uh, history of the credit and why few companies are claiming them, uh, why I see it as a misnomer, why, a, why it's the same as a pencil letter or a tin can, just a poor name for something. And I'll talk about the R&D tax credit study, and then I'll talk a little bit about the new CARES Act and how it's benefited uh, the R&D tax credit. So the R&D tax credit up until 2016 was a temporary part of the tax structure. And so it would sunset every couple of years and then get retroactively reenacted. And a lot of companies just didn't want to invest the time up front to, uh, to do a study because they never knew when the credit would go away. So why did it become permanent? Uh, this was something that was invented in the United States in 1980. And I just, uh, this was the last time I flew, I took a photo of this. This is Hungary uh, talking about its R&D incentives. So now there are R&D tax credits and incentives in more than 30 countries in the world. So this is something that there's a battle for intellectual property. Uh, this is something that's not going to be going away anytime soon. This is definitely a permanent part. Both parties support 
this tax credit in Congress. So it's still largely, there's less than 35,000 companies claiming it in this uh, entire country, still largely something that uh, the Fortune 5000 write, uh, write the code and uh, their lobbyists write the code and they're the ones that benefit the most. But what this start, uh, chart shows, and this is from a Nurse and Young study a few years back, is you don't have to have 250 million and more in assets to be claiming the, the big piece of the credit. You could have be a very small company, like I mentioned earlier, not even need a tax credit study, but claim the credit. So there's $10 billion that was given back last year as part of this credit on a federal level. If you were to take this pie, and cut it in half, that represents 100 multinationals taking half, 5 billion of this tax credit. So they're the ones that have the staff, they're the ones that, uh, uh, that are taking the large advantage of it. Uh, the Apples, the Microsofts, the certainly companies with a lot of innovation, but uh, a lot of lobby dollars as well. Uh, for most companies, uh, it does involve uh, some paperwork and uh, it, to, so some companies would rather spend a uh, uh, hundred hours in, in making uh, uh, another $100,000 uh, rather than trying to recoup another twenty dollars or $30,000 in the credit. Now, uh, as you know, a dollar for dollar tax credit is uh, valued a lot more than $100,000 in sales, but um, most companies just uh, still don't want to spend a lot of time doing this. So this is an investment of time for most companies. The first year uh, does take about 15 to 25 hours and it's mostly uh, interviewing engineers and process people uh, that first year to set up the system. But the good news is after it's set up with the study in place in following years, it's just uh, the people that are involved in the process only spend 15 to 20 minutes basically filling out a one page survey talking about their activities. So in subsequent years, it becomes, uh, it's an annuity. There's really not that much work that is involved, but there is an investment that first year to do a study. This is not uh, accounting work. Typically we work with, uh, with a CFO or a controller, but uh, they will spend some time getting some background financial information but it's mostly, again, it's the draftsmen, the engineers, the technical salespeople, the people that are involved, the, uh, uh, the lean officers. These are the people that, uh, um, that are doing the work for the credits. And so it is a little bit of a disruption for your engineering uh, staff. So also, um, if it is a substantial enough tax credit, the IRS or the, the Department of Revenue they will send in an engineer, not a CPA. And so it's uh, always good to have the engineers, uh, which we're a group of engineers, we also have CPAs on staff, but it's always good to have the engineers providing the documentation to the IRS rather than the financial people. And this is why the uh, manufacturing extension partnerships have a lot of experience with the R&D tax credit because a lot of CPAs, they uh, might visit their client once a year, but often it's the other way around, but often they're never out on the factory floor. They never really have a, a firm grasp of the processes that go on in a manufacturing facility. And so they may not realize what their clients do that qualify. So uh, this country is, uh, is full of, uh, of butchers and, and bakers and restaurateurs, and uh, these folks don't qualify for this credit. It's, it's the candlestick makers, it's the, uh, the manufacturers that qualify. And so if a CPA has 200 business clients, they might have one that qualify. And only the, really the big four firms and some of the large regional firms is where we find CPAs firms that have engineers on staff. So... Uh, other reasons, it, um, in the past, it, it did not lower uh, uh, taxes below AMT. Now for certain businesses uh, under 50 million in revenue, it does. And also for startups, even though I guess no one's paying income, ta uh, not income tax, uh, uh, no one's paying payroll taxes right now, um, but uh, this also for companies that don't owe 
federal taxes, uh, the federal portion can offset the FICA taxes for certain companies that are in a, um, within a certain parameter within a five years uh, or less. Um, and it has to be a certain size business. It's pretty much done to incentivize startups. And uh, so, yeah, so, so don't think that if you're having, as, as a lot of companies now uh, aren't having the best year financially and might not be paying taxes on a federal level, uh, there is a federal portion that can offset payroll taxes for some companies. Uh, the firm I work with, I've been with them for 15 years. Uh, that's all that we do. Uh, this was started by uh, back when there was a big six accounting firms. Um, we serve about 1% of uh, U.S. businesses claiming the credits, which is uh, still right around 400 clients or so. And uh, typically when I do this presentation, it's, uh, it is uh, in front of an audience. I'm still learning the, the Zoom presentation style. Thank you for bearing with me. Uh, and I'm typically teaching CPAs uh, professional education credits, uh, kind of getting them introduced to the credit. So because I'm not teaching CPAs, I know there's a couple out there in the audience, um, I need to uh, CMA, I need to cover my behind. So I should let you know that um, this should not be construed as legal or tax advice. And please do consult an attorney or tax professional regarding your specific legal or tax situation. So this was uh, uh, enacted uh, under the Reagan administration. The whole idea at that time, we, uh, we saw Taiwan, we saw Korea, it's a lot of countries that uh, uh, were starting to get some technological prowess and uh, we wanted to keep our, uh, our high tech jobs and, 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 our, and our technology here. And one of the things that this credit is incentivized to do is to have businesses risk trying new things, trying new processes, uh, maybe even entering a new line of business. And for the first 20 years, this credit, it really was to, uh, it really was for R&D, it really was for, uh, for Nobel Prize kind of uh, real science, discovery of new information. What happened in 2001 after the dot-com crash is, uh, uh, we needed to supercharge this credit. We had uh, a lot of very uh, educated people coming from India, from China, that suddenly were, uh, were, were without a job. And how do we retain this talent here? Uh, one of the ways this was done was to, um, to change the law so it no longer had to be new to an organization, I'm sorry, new to the body of science, had to be new to your organization. So. It doesn't matter if your competitor already has a process that you're trying to figure out. As long as you're making an effort, taking a risk to figure that process out, that's the appropriateness of design. That allowed real expansion of this credit. And unfortunately, we still use that old name R&D, even though it's much more loosely defined in terms of the law. In 2008, what had happened was um, there was between 2001 and 2008 some unscrupulous uh, uh, businesses uh, taking advantage of this credit. So at that time, it became a tier one designation, meaning that every single time that a company was audited, this credit had to be examined. So we saw a lot more audits during this time between 2008 and 2012 when the tier system was dissolved. So now every time a company gets audited, um, boy, if I knew why they chose the credit, it's not necessarily the size, but uh, yes, yeah, so sometimes will a company have a small credit get audited? Sometimes it'll have an enormous credit. They get audited, the, the IRS does not want to look at the, uh, the R&D tax credit portion of it. In 2016, um, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, AMT was no longer a limitation for, for businesses in uh, less than 50 million in average gross receipts for the prior three years. And then the FICA, this was for businesses, again, with uh, less than 5 million in annual gross receipts and having gross receipts for no more than five years. Um, almost $7,500 per employee 
uh, per year uh, uh, can be credited. And I look at this, uh, you know, for a startup, that's a, that could be a month's burn rate for, for their high paying employees. So unfortunately, this, uh, the, the, the name R&D tax credit, it's, uh, it, it tends to, uh, to, to, people will shut the door. Uh, I, I can't tell you how many times I hear people saying, we don't do R&D, our company doesn't do R&D. We don't have a lab, but uh, again, it's, it's a misnomer. If, um, if, I was, uh, if, I, if I could rename this tax credit, uh, I would call it the how to can we tax credit. Every time that, uh, that, that you're sitting around in your organization having these, how do we do this? Can we do this? Can we enter this market? Can we build this widget? These are the kinds of activities and thoughts that occur. This is what the credit is here to incentivize. Ultimately bringing and creating and retaining uh, higher wage jobs in this country. <clears throat> so what are the activities that qualify? Now, it's basically product, process, and software development or improvement. Now, a lot of the things that you're doing to build something, to build it better, to build it leaner, these activities qualify. And it's very important to note that uh, this isn't just effort, but thought as well. And this becomes important because one of the ways that we measure this, I'll get into this uh, shortly, is uh, the amount of time that somebody is working. And it's not necessarily for business owners uh, and some uh, certainly uh, people that start businesses, um, the, they, they might be working on things way past that 40 hour work week. And it's important to note that um, it's the portion of time that you spend doing this, not necessarily the portion of time that you're spending in front of a, in front of a table or, or in front of a computer. For, uh, for process development and continuous improvement, there's, it's, it's amazing what, uh, what qualifies. Um, it's not just the, the quality planning, it's not just uh, uh, the uh, working towards uh, CGMP or FDA approval, the, it's also uh, kosher, CE, ISO, other different kinds of certifications and the efforts that you're putting forward into attaining these. It's important to note that um, education does not qualify implementation does. So if you're having a Kaizen workshop, some of that's going to qualify. Some of it, the education part, will not. Uh, there is right now uh, a bill in Congress spearheaded by Senator Coons in, uh, in uh, Delaware that uh, will, uh, if it goes through, uh, we'll see. Uh, also, uh, they want to have some of the education portion qualify as well. So this might become a more attractive tax credit uh, as uh, next year if this works, or if this passes, I should say. Within most uh, organizations, the uh, most of the money that's found in this credit is tied to wages of the individuals that are making the designs that are making the improvements that are making the software, the engineers, the draftsmen, the CNC programmers, uh, these are the individuals who's, uh, you take a portion and when we do a study, we come in and we interview these individuals. That's why it takes some time to determine a defensible position of qualifying activities within that individual's uh, yearly, daily, weekly time schedule. We apply that towards their salary and the result is called the qualified research expenditure for that person's wages. Now, the other portion is supplies and that is consumed, uh, materials consumed in creation of prototype. So it's not for depreciable equipment, but uh, it's for the um, different types of, it uh, could be a metal. If you're creating a prototype and qualifies as a prototype, you can have not only the wages of the designers that are working on it qualify, you could also have all of the costs of the metal 
be part of the qualified expenditure as well as the direct labor. So for some businesses that have substantial prototype costs in a given year, that could really boost their credit up. Um, if your company uses a lot of fixtures, molds, and jigs, there's a, a tax court case I have up there that uh, you could Google it or I could send that to you that uh, has really opened up uh, a, a lot of, uh, of mold costs for, for certain manufacturers. The third place is the contractors. Uh, same criteria as the W-2 wages. Uh, they have to be in the United States. I should mention all of this activity has to, to uh, exist in the United States. With, uh, the, w, uh, with, with the contractors, uh, you only capture 35, uh, 65% of their costs. The government considers 35% of that contractor's cost to be their overhead. So. Uh, a contractor that's often missed uh, when, uh, when people are claiming the credit is the patent attorney. So an example is uh, uh, buy, sell, or patent litigation doesn't qualify, but patent prosecution, getting that patent from the patent search to all of the other things uh, that, that are involved working with the uh, patent office, those kind of costs qualify. Again, 65% of it, uh, it goes uh, for the R&D and 35% of it goes for that uh, fancy uh, office that the patent attorney is working. So that 35% does not qualify, but 65% of it does. So always if you're able to bring someone in on an R&D, uh, if you can bring them in on a W-2, you're going to have a larger benefit than if you're paying them on a 1099. So um, the things that must be met, uh, there's four laws, and um, uh, if it, I have uh, more information on them towards the end that typically I'll, uh, uh, I'll discuss with CPAs, but um, ba basically it has to be a permitted purpose. Is this something that is part of your business or is you doing something for someone else? So if you are hiring somebody to make an iPhone app for your business, that's your R&D. The software company, that's not their R&D. So if you're, um, same thing, that patent attorney can't claim the R&D tax credit because that's not their business component. They're making something for your business if you're paying them. Has to be technological in nature, which the other three kind of fall in line. Uh, a lot of engineers will tell me uh, they, they, they knew right away this was going to work. Uh, it just took them two years to figure out how to do it. There has to be that uncertainty at the start of, uh, of a project, and you have to find different ways, using the scientific method, different ways to get to that end result. There has to be that unknown. So we've seen uh, companies in the past uh, try to claim uh, like uh, roofing contractors, solar contractors, uh, they're doing a lot of these things. They're, they're having technological uh, nature. They're, there's some experimentation, but there's really not that much uncertainty if it is a component that's been done. If it's just the same thing and you're replicating it on a different roof, there's not that method. There's not enough of uncertainty for the, uh, for the activity to qualify for the credit. With software, there has to be a, a little bit more requirements. Um, has to be more of a financial risk and has to be a higher threshold of innovation. Um, there's also with this uh, final regulations that came out recently, um, you have to uh, divide the um, internal use versus external use software. So I, I spend, uh, I have another hour presentation that I do for, for, for CPAs that are just on software. This is for manufacturing. I'd be happy to have uh, to answer any questions about software offline. But I think it's important to note that CNC programming is a qualified activity under software. And then website design activities also qualify. So a lot of businesses are paying a decent sum of money for a third party to create their websites for them. And some of those costs will, uh, will qualify for the credit. <clears throat> So the um, Arizona and then the Arizona Department of Commerce uh, does, uh, has, uh, is very knowledgeable about this. I'm really happy to, to work with them. They, um, uh, the, the state R&D tax credit, it, it leverages off the, uh, the uh, Section 41, which is the federal. 
And uh, it's one of those things where there's different metrics that, uh, uh, that are involved where some of our clients, uh, sometimes the Arizona credits uh, on a given year will exceed the federal credits. And on the, the very next year, they'll have absolutely no Arizona credit. So it's not something that I ever try to uh, excite people about. I can guarantee you the federal credit, the Arizona, hey, there's, there, there might be something for you there as well. A great thing about the Arizona is one of the few states that has a refundable tax credit for smaller businesses. Uh, it, it is, uh, it's, uh, it, our clients that, that, that claim it, it's great for them. You're only getting 75% of the business, uh, pardon me, 75% of the money, but this is a check that's coming to you. And typically these businesses that are, are, are trying for this credit, they're not taxpayers. So this is in a sense, free money. The, the hard part is, is uh, they're, they're spending between Christmas and New Year's trying to get all of their paperwork done, things that they're usually waiting for uh, uh, until they're, you know, March 15th at times to file. Uh, it, it, you have to really have everything ready. So for example, if you wanted to claim that uh, the 2020 um, tax credit, refundable tax credit, you've got to get all the paperwork in, all your ducks lined up in a row for, I can't remember what it's going to be this year, January 2nd or 3rd or 4th, whatever the first business day of the year is, and you've got to get it in there. And um, that $5 million, uh, it, it, gets, it gets taken up pretty quickly because there's a lot of businesses that do want that, that cash in flux at the start of the year. Here's an example of, uh, of, of a client that, uh, just to get an idea of this client uh, does business in three states. And just to give you an idea for their federal results, uh, there was almost 61,000. The New Business Ohio, which uh, definitely doesn't, uh, isn't as generous as, as Arizona. That was their Ohio tax credit. And then their Arizona tax credit that year was, uh, you know, uh, looks like about 60% or so of their federal credit. So it's definitely something that uh, not all states have it. Uh, California has a generous credits. Uh, Oregon, Washington no longer do. Idaho has one, but it's, it, it's nice. It's, uh, it does help retain and attract businesses to your state. So Jim, I uh, uh, hope you had maybe a couple questions that might have come up. Uh, I want to take a little pause here, drink some water, see if there's any questions I can answer before I uh, go on. Yeah, we do have one question so far uh, from Brandon. Does not include equipment, question mark. We have a specific piece of equipment for some R&D that we are doing. Okay. So if the equipment, uh, it, it, in general, depreciable equipment does not qualify. So um, if a, and typically equipment for R&D doesn't qualify either. Um, if the equipment was built in house, uh, then it, it, that would uh, potentially qualify. Um, another thing is if the equipment is owed, uh, owned by somebody else, so they're taking a depreciation, there may be a potential for it to qualify. But as a rule, depreciable items do not qualify. Thank you, Tony. Should Should anyone else have any questions? I kind of wanted to get uh, through the uh, through the meats of uh, of the credits, and then kind of go on to what I find more exciting is uh, how it uh, applies in uh, in different organizations. And Jim, I uh, yeah, certainly if uh, as questions come in, um, if, especially if it's relevant to a slide, by all means, uh, uh, let me know, and I can try to answer on the spot. Okay, there's one more question that just came in. <clears throat> Mention the cost to hire. Would this include? the fee to use a staffing agency? Uh, no, it's, it's box one W2. So um, I'll have to be honest with you, I'm not, so we work with a, a couple of staffing agencies, but uh, I don't believe that is part of the W2. So if it's, on, if it's box one W2, it will qualify. But if you're paying uh, separately for a staffing agency, it will not. Uh, and then companies that that uh, is, that are doing payroll, where they're the ones that are uh, doing the um, uh, 
uh, that you're kind of paying them to use their workers, that's still going to be your R&D. And when we come to that circumstance, we work closely with uh, the, the company to make sure that uh, uh, the, all the information is passed through and the R&D belongs to the company, not to the agency that they're hiring. Okay, thank you. You bet. So a uh, couple of things to consider. What is uh, the next few slides, uh, just to help cement this in, is this R&D or is this not? So this certainly a guy mixing beakers looks like R&D to me. Um, architecture has a lot of uh, activities that qualify. So do mock-ups, a lot of different mock-ups that you're doing, whether it be the first run prototype or, or a mock-up of something you're going to build, those costs will qualify. Art, unfortunately, does not qualify. Things that are of artistic nature or seasonality, flavors, these type of things are not considered qualifying activities. Uh, drafting absolutely qualifies, um, whether it be on a computer or, or the old fashioned way, back of the napkin sketches not only qualify, we've uh, used those as uh, when companies, uh, when the IRS is inquiring on a company, how did you come up with certain ideas? We've actually had things like that to, to submit to them to qualify as defense. So these two people are welding. Same activity. The one on the left is a beam on a building, doesn't qualify. That same welder, if he's or uh, she's working on a, on a prototype, again, that activity will qualify. Not only the design cost, but the material and direct labor, direct labor will qualify. Uh, these both have R&D. Wine, Often you don't have an idea if a batch came out perfectly until years down the line. Certainly is R&D in wine, but there's a lot more in beer per size of the organization. Brewers are always doing test batches, and those test batches are in essence prototypes of their uh, product. Uh, molds, fixtures, those are qualifying costs. Um, the CNC machinist, uh, those uh, costs associated with machining don't qualify. The CNC programmer, those costs do qualify. A lot of organizations we work with, uh, they'll, they'll train across the floor where a lot of their machinists will also have some programming time and knowledge. So uh, uh, here's a, a case study that um, kind of talks a lot about the uh, the different things that i've been uh, speaking with uh, in the past and this is a uh, third uh, actually on the fourth generation now of ownership i need to update these slides uh update uh, uh, up to 80 employees now um same owner but one added uh, there's five owners now with the son it's just happened last year. I should really update this. Uh, and they work with uh, one, I think, the late 80th largest regional firm in, in the country. And they make metal buildings. And from the outside, looking at them, it doesn't look like there might be a whole lot of R&D there. And uh, their CPA firm originally thought that was the case. Well, we started working with them and realized that even though they're in rural Oregon, they're competing on projects as far away as Alaska and as far away as uh, uh, they have clients in Arizona. And uh, they do a lot of calculation. They do a lot of uh, pre-building in a way that makes them competitive in a long uh, way outside of what you would think is their region. <clears throat> so another example of, uh, of a storage building that they do. And so they, they were really happy. We're, it wasn't an enormous credit, but uh, you know, it was uh, uh, north of, uh, uh, of 60,000. And uh, so lo and behold, they, uh, they were audited. And this was in 2013, back when there was still that tier one issue. So here's an example of the R&D tax credit had nothing to do with him getting audited. This was the owner was getting audited from his personal taxes, went up to his corporation, and went through and um, ended up, because it was a tier one issue at that time, they had to, the IRS had to take a look at the credit. So here's a, uh, what 
I like to illustrate here is um, it's kind of, uh, it goes kind of against the grain of the thinking where the, if a credit is large enough, I mentioned earlier that the IRS will bring in an engineer. And for us, when we're doing audit defense, that can mean, oh, we can, you know, we got this, uh, you know, five or six hours of our time and we've got this covered. So, um, she, uh, yeah, yeah, who was it? She didn't have any experience or knowledge of the rules or guidance of the, or the guidelines. In essence, what we ended up doing working with this IRS agent was giving her about 20 hours of, of free education on the credits. So the size of the credits, uh, sometimes the larger the credit, the easier it is to deal with the people that are coming and examining it. So- Hey, Tony? Uh, yes. Sorry to interrupt, we have another question here. Do you want me to hold that or? No, perfect, perfect segue, please, they're perfect okay. time. So this is from Beth. We are a manufacturer of supplements. We work on improving processes, lean, FDA audits, customer audits, SQF, NSF, GMP, et cetera. We also do a lot of R&D for our customers. This includes formulation, mixing base, mixing base ingredients, and then we have to pilot them to make sure that they work on our equipment. Do all of these activities qualify? Uh. Boy, uh, is, there, is there, let me see. Yeah, if you click on the Q&A box, you'll see the, the question as well. Hi, Beth, nice to know that you've joined us. Um, Beth, I, I, I believe that uh, we have been claiming those, um, and I can't, I, I apologize, I'm clicking on it, but uh, uh, could you restate that, Jim? I'm sorry, I, I don't sure. want to blatantly uh, answer that all of them qualify <laughs> when, uh, yeah, there's a lot here. So we are a manufacturer of supplements. We work moving processes, lean FDA audits, customer yes. audits, SQF, NSF, et cetera. We also do a lot of R&D for our customers. This includes formulations, mixing base ingredients, and then we have to pilot them to make sure that they work on our equipment. Do all of these activities qualify? Uh, I would think that some of the activities that wouldn't qualify, Beth, and I, 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 I can certainly check with you uh, and get back to you because I know we're working with you, but um, I think some of the ones that, that don't qualify in your organizations uh, would be the ones that you're working with on your customers if you're expressly releasing that as your client's uh, IP. So, uh, for example, if, uh, if you have a special formulation from a customer and you've under contract signed that you can't sell that formulation to another client, that would lead us to believe that you're relinquishing that as your client's uh, intellectual property. All of the formulation, all of the processes that are unique to your organization, those are uh, costs that you should be claiming for your R&D tax credit. Oops, uh, I, I, I hope that's uh, sufficient. And Beth, I can, I, I can certainly follow up with you as well if there's a, a question that I wasn't able to answer. May I continue? Is there any, uh, another one, Jim? No, no please no. continue. Okay, sure. So what does an R&D tax credit accomplish, uh, study accomplish? It's, uh, as I mentioned, it's something that, uh, uh, on your organization's side after that initial year, there should be minimal involvement. Uh, should this, uh, this is something that uh, people are filling out surveys. There's maybe a little bit of project write-up, but not a whole lot of work that needs to be done to continue getting this money from the, uh, uh, from the federal and, and state governments or saving money. So, also what it does is um, it, it allows uh, some business owners, when they, when they come in, they, uh, before a study, they have one way of looking at their R&D costs in their organization. After a study, they really realize, well, this is my true R&D budget. Um, and I, I, what we've seen uh, is often a business will become more lean with their R&D expenses as a result of having a tax credit study done. So ultimately you're doing it to save money on taxes, but a lot of businesses will also find that they're saving money on R&D as a result of the study. 
Now we come in, we work with a lot of defense contractors and uh, they and, and many other businesses have project-based accounting where there's time tracking that, uh, uh, that they use for their employees. Now, time tracking is a great, uh, it's kind of one of the legs of the stool in, in audit defense. If it's there, we'd love to incorporate that into being able to track R&D costs. However, what we find is a lot of money is left on the table if that's the only way that the R&D is being tracked because it's only really being tracked at that level of the person entering the time tracking, which it often does not include meetings. Uh, it doesn't include things that might be done off the clock. Uh, there's a lot of uh, things that um, not only will a study capture these outside costs that aren't during time tracking, but it's also going to be supportive, which is what we're doing when we're speaking and interviewing. This is employee testimony. We're documenting all of the things that are going on within the organization. And it's also very useful so when the, uh, if a client is, uh, is audited and somebody that was doing the time tracking and the actual people are long gone working for another business or, or started their own business um, and they have no interest in speaking with the IRS, uh, having that documentation that is a great way to defend the credit claim many years after an employee uh, may have left the organization. So here uh, in the next two slides, this is, um, this is a case study of uh, the, the company, they make uh, connectors for, uh, uh, for unmanned aerial vehicles. And so they were claiming the credit when we uh, came in and their CPA had hired us because the CPA had, uh, had realized there was a lot of things that were being left on the table. And when we uh, first worked with them, when we first saw their credit claim, they were claiming their R&D tax credit and what they considered their R&D department. They had, um, uh, they had their engineers and designers, they had five people, and that was the only, their R&D claim was only for the salaries of those individuals. So between those individuals, they had a $500,000 payroll, and they were claiming that a hundred percent of everything they uh, they do is r and d, which technically uh, can't really be substantiated, but um, essentially uh, most uh, substantially all of what they were doing was r and d. And so they were getting um, about um, that five hundred thousand dollars was their qualified research expenditure. So, as a, as a rule, the tax credits is about six to seven and a half percent of qualified research expenditure. So they're claiming around a thirty thirty two thousand dollar tax credit every year for the couple of years before they had the study. What they didn't realize is um, they had a leader who uh, was getting paid uh, close to five hundred thousand dollars. Was uh, the one that started the company, very technically involved. I call him. Uh, 1985 Bill Gates uh, before he was uh, leading his foundation. Um, so about half, we determined we could defend half of that leader's position as R&D involvement because that individual was doing a lot of things in the lab with the engineers. They had some very highly uh, compensated, um, especially their VP of sales, uh, uh, technical sales. And so they, they had missed out these people that so that wasn't their entire salary. The salesperson was getting an obscene amount of money, but a lot of it, you know, a certain portion of that was qualified because it was technical sales. So these are qualifying costs that they missed prior to the study. They had some people on their factory floor that had been there for a long time that uh, were the ones that were making on the fly decisions, so a small portion of their time qualified. And they were very heavily invested in lean where um, one day, um, one day a month, they were due lean. And so um, there was uh, the, the continuous improvement activities. We were able to find some money there for salaries. So before the study, they were getting a $30,000 tax credit, and we were able to more than double that tax credit following the study. Again, a lot of companies, that's what they see on their R&D. 
and they'll do things like they will include appreciable equipment in there, which, uh, which isn't qualified at all. But um, yeah, it's typically when we see companies claiming the credit without a study, then um, there, there's a lot that's left on the table. Now, again, if you're that organization just has one or two people that are involved in sales and engineering, you don't need a study. Um, I'm more than happy to sit down with you and your CPA in an hour, two hours time, uh, we could get you a couple thousand dollars and, and, and I don't charge for that kind of work. So there's definitely opportunities here. Don't think you have to have a, this kind of a staff. If you're doing R&D activities, uh, I'd like to see you get that credit. <clears throat> so people uh, often ask, well, geez, what, what do I need for documentation? Uh, is this going to be onerous? Is there a lot of things that I need to create? And, and no, absolutely not. Um, if you're doing R&D, you already have what you need, this contemporaneous documentation, unless you've had a fire or a system crash or something like that, which does indeed happen. So, um, you know, the, the, the manuals that you keep, the, um, uh, the, the, you know, even the inventor's books that uh, a, any inventor is taught to, to keep notes on. Uh, these are all things that exist in your organization. Uh, it's important to note that um, you need to identify and locate where the documents are you don't need to compile them uh, in an audit. That's when we'll do some compilation and things. Um, and uh, it's not something that, uh, you know, most companies uh, uh, get audited once every 30 years or so. So this isn't something you want to be prepared for this, but it's not something that, uh, that should be onerous. Um, the, the, the government uh, does not want small businesses uh, to, uh, believe it or not, <laughs> to drown in paperwork. Um, so it's the identification, there's compilations of, of a couple projects a year that you always want to keep notes on, but it's not something, you know, the, the employee testimony, and, and I can't state that enough, where we see companies getting into trouble is the CPA and the, uh, uh, the CFO have a chat over the phone. Oh, what do you think Joe did uh, this year? Oh, what does Susie do this year? And that's kind of, they come up with their credit that way and that's gonna get thrown right out. There has to be some support from the people that are doing the work that qualifies. So the IRS allows for use of best estimates for, for past years. Um, if your company's a startup, uh, there's different rules, but uh, most of the manufacturers here are, are a number of years old. So typically, um, you'll need at least three years of past R&D data, sometimes further. There's different ways to calculate the credits, and it's always a cost-benefit analysis of uh, do you take a smaller credit with a little bit less work, or do you take the largest possible credits, and is it defensible going back to past years? A uh, couple of, and I, I, I know these will be available, but these are two uh, uh, really good case studies. I know there's a, a number of CPAs that I believe uh, signed up for this. Those are really good tax court cases to, uh, uh, if you want to take a look and learn a little bit more on the methodology that, um, uh, that is supported. <clears throat> is there any uh, questions in the meantime, Jim? I'm going to go on a couple of case studies. Hey, Tony, um, no questions yet. We only have about a little over five minutes left. Oh, dear. Um, you know, oh, just so give you a heads up, so. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. I, yeah, I thought I had a little more time today. So, okay. So, um, uh, basically, I, I chose a couple of, of examples here of, uh, and I'll run it through them, but of businesses that we work with that qualify um, just based, I know, on the activities uh, uh, of some of the attendees. But uh, uh, ex extrusion, uh, molding companies qualify. We work with a lot of, uh, of companies that bend metal. So whether it be sheet metal, um, would it be CNC machining, rolling, all of these companies. Um, I love working with metal benders because they think that, well, we've We've been in you know, 5,000 years, we've been bending metal. How is this R&D? But uh, there's certainly a lot of it that qualifies. Got a, a lot of uh, firearms manufacturers as well as um, companies that do cut and sew in, in that industry as well. Um, electronic manufacturers, uh, anyone that's doing printed circuit boards, a lot of R&D there. 
a lot of R&D in design of facilities and um, different engineering uh, services. Uh, we work with a lot. This is one of our larger clients. This is a 4,000 employee business that uh, uh, it's great. I get to drive down the street. They have uh, uh, these in almost every town, snorkel and uh, extreme manufacturing. They make snorkel lifts. Hey, Tony. Um, yes, sir. I apologize. Um, we do actually, this, this goes to uh, 1030. So um, if we need to revisit any of these or we'll okay. have- Oh, no, 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 you just, that's, thank, thank you. you so just, I was just uh, corrected on the side here. No, that's all good. No, I wanted to leave a good 15 minutes for Q&A. Good, thank you. You scared me there. So appreciate that. So um, this is a, an example of a business that um, has a periodically uh, enormous um, uh, prototype costs. They do a lot, uh, they do ferries, uh, they're, they're shipbuilders. So um, they were, uh, they worked uh, two years, three years ago with uh, building a, um, a, uh, a boat for the Israeli military. And they had, uh, I think 20 million or so just in qualifying expenditures on one boat because it's never been done before. And so that was about a $600,000 tax credit for just that one vessel. So, um, and, and in other years, our credit's not nearly as high, but yeah, every once in a while, they work on a project that qualifies where you're again, getting that material cost and the direct labor, not just the engineering costs that qualify. Uh, we do a lot of work with companies in, in aerospace, uh, a number of, uh, of clients in, in, in the Phoenix area. Uh, and around the country that um, a lot, uh, th there's um, uh, so much substantiation that goes on, that so much paperwork that goes on, that uh, a lot of the reporting that's part of your process validation is also part of qualifying in, in, these, uh, in aerospace. Uh, work with a lot of different uh, vehicle manufacturers. This is a fun one to work with. Uh, and then again, uh, uh, process equipment. Um, it's, uh, you'll have businesses that um, they're not just doing the individual tanks and such, but they're, they're designing how it all fits together. So there's a lot of engineering costs and also at times prototype, co prototype costs in these businesses. Just uh, some other different examples. Uh, companies that uh, are specialty equipment manufacturers association businesses, uh, they have a lot of R&D. What happens is uh, every year, a couple of years, uh, whether it be Jeep or Ford or, or Dodge, Chevy, they'll, they'll change their vehicles. And on that given year, anything aftermarket to fit the vehicle has to be changed also. So their innovation is driven by other businesses and the needs and demands and evolution of other businesses. So, so if your business and, and, and you know, the, the, this company, they thought, well, yeah, this is, this is an R and D. This is what we do every day, but the, you might look at your own business and, and, and look at it that same way. If your business is reliant on keeping up with other industries, you're probably doing things that are qualified for the R and D tax credit. Uh, here's just some examples of, of some documentation of, uh, of how, um, and uh, this is proprietary to a client, so it's a little bit fuzzy, but uh, basically just kind of going through, and this is a, an example of the surveys that this client, that we constructed for this client, and it goes basically from uh, product conceptualization all the way through, through validation, through patentability if they have it, the different meetings that are involved. And basically this is the way that they document it per their employee. And then <clears throat> when we take that, we take it into the different employees. These are the people's names. They each filled out a survey. And then we have this, you know, we narrow this down. Uh, somebody in software is doing, you know, the bulk of their time of qualifying this technical salesperson there. You know, a lot of what, uh, uh, what she does is, is just client support, but a lot, she also goes out and meets and figures out the needs, comes back, speaks with their engineering department and, and their software department. This is a, a hardware software business. And, uh, and, and so a portion of her time qualifies as well. 
president is still highly involved in, in leading it. And uh, then the graphic artist, and this is important, again, I, I noted earlier that art doesn't qualify. However, sometimes when the graphic artists in this particular case, they're doing packaging design. So most of what this uh, graphic artist does doesn't qualify. When they're getting it and doing the math and getting it to go onto a package, so about 20%, about uh, uh, <clears throat> a couple hours a day, pretty much, or maybe hour or two a day of this person's time is involved in activities that qualify. Uh, let's see. Oh, this, is, uh, this is an example of, of software I mentioned earlier uh, where we have to have something with <clears throat> something that's customer facing that will qualify something that's internal won't qualify so when we work with software companies there's uh, uh there, there's that extra step in software portions of it will qualify portions will not and these are all just kind of different documents that you know the, the the project that we when we complete we give all of this documentation for our clients and then the clients can use this uh, year after year to uh, to defend their credit and and claim the credits uh, in their company <clears throat> boy I uh, my, my my voice was probably only expecting an hour of gym as well <clears throat> so here's some examples of uh, of what gets companies in trouble. <clears throat> Another tax court case for your CPAs, basically outlining how not to do a, a study. Um, there has to be that documentation that exists, uh, has to be contemporaneous to the time of it existing. And um, basically, yes, without a system in place, without that study for a lot of organizations, this is overly burdensome. Now, I spoke of this earlier, use of estimates without employee testimony. This again, this is that example of, of the business owner and the CPA guessing on what their employees are doing as far as R&D. Now, one thing that I'd like to urge all businesses that are claiming the credit to do is uh, as part of their exit interviews, when an employee leaves an organization, to have them sit down and spend that 15 minutes and to fill out a survey and saying, yes, this is what I did for this organization during this time. Because once that employee leaves, the IRS comes in, they'll ask. They, don't, they won't wanna just talk to the employees that are there now. They'll wanna take a look at past years and say, well, where is that person now? How do we, how, how do we uh, get that information? And if you don't have this, uh, testimony in written form, your ability to defend that R&D is substantially decreased. <clears throat> there has to be a nexus. You have to link the qualified expenditures and the business components. Now, what uh, we had a couple years ago, um, we had a number of audits where um, I, I, the, the IRS, I guess, had an, a memo where there was some abuse of production waste versus prototype waste. And so we were working with some food processors and uh, we ended up just advising all the food processors to take uh, still shots of where their prototype waste was and where the production waste was. So just put up a couple cameras and none of them were audited in, in subsequent years, but if they did, they would have actual physical, not physical, but digital documentation of what their substantiated costs were. And so it can be important, especially if your prototype waste is substantial, to, uh, to document that in a way outside of just a ledger. Now, uh, a number of years ago, uh, another case study happened, and that's Shammy versus Commissioner. Uh, that was a tax court case, pardon me. And uh, what that was, was a businessman had uh, bought a beauty company and uh, this gentleman did not have uh, any scientific knowledge, but was paying himself several million dollars a year in salary and um, got audited and uh, it was all overturned. And so we had a subsequent couple audits of our clients, anyone with the role CEO or president 
right away the IRS would overturn that, saying, well, no, this person is an executive. They're, they're not uh, doing R&D. But you know, the fact is a lot of our clients, they're, they're smaller businesses, and uh, the, the founders are the ones that came up with the idea and are still heavily involved in it. So um, I would, uh, we always try to, to tone down the CEO's role and the percentage uh, just to make it more believable, unfortunately, because uh, someone that comes in that audits your organization, we always look at this as an audit's inevitably going to get uh, take place, even though very few of our audit uh, clients get audited. But um, you, someone with the card of CEO, you're going to have to sit down and you know make sure that uh, that you're not over exaggerating that at all, because. The, uh, the person on the other end uh, that, that's auditing you will, will probably want to throw that out just because of what's happened with other people taking advantage of that role. <clears throat> so with the CARES Act that just came in, um, it allows 100% uh, of NOLs um, for 18 and 19 and 20 to be carried back five years. It used to be just 80%. So in essence, what this does is it opens up uh, R&D opportunities to go back as far as 2013. So uh, what happens then if you claim an R&D tax credit, when you amend that return, it'll increase your taxable income. But if you have that NOL to offset it, that's going to actually be able to wipe that out as well. Now, the um, what will happen if you um, if you uh, go back and you um, should say uh, let's probably a better way to let's see so 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 basically um, if you haven't been claiming it in past years and you apply that NOL carry back it can also apply significant benefits so. What happens is the um, even if you can't use the R&D tax credit five years back, uh, if you uh, it, you can take that tax credit and then carry it forward, and even if you uh, you can use your net operating losses to reduce your taxes for past years, and keep the R&D tax credit because the R&D tax credit the great thing about it is it carries forward for twenty years. So. This is something that it's an unusual circumstance for most businesses, but um, the um, uh, here's here's an example. It's an unusual, uh, you know. If you have the thing is, uh, right now it's unusual, but uh, you know, in 2021, uh, we're going to have some losses in businesses. What you're going to be able to do is take these losses, carry them back. And not only will you be able to take those, um, those losses to reduce taxes in past years, you can free up these R&D tax credits and carry them forward to be used in future years if they're not used in past years already. So this is something that, again, our, um, I think is very notable to, uh, to, uh, to highlight this opportunity uh, we take care of the R&D tax credit. This is something that uh, you want to discuss with your CPA because they're going to be the ones that know best how this applies into your uh, circumstance. So, um, Jim, I wanted to, to kind of leave the rest uh, of the time up for questions. Um, I did kind of rush through a couple of those slides when I thought I didn't have time. Uh, what I've left in the last of the, uh, the slides are mostly things that um, I want businesses to take back, the kind of questions that they might want to ask themselves to know if, whether or not they have qualifying activities. But uh, um, I can go through these, or if there's questions that, uh, that uh, the attendees had, I think that might be a more uh, uh, opportune uh, use of our time. Okay. Um, a couple of questions here. So how about key deadlines as far as the federal and the Arizona R&D tax credits? Uh, well, that, de that, that depends on the, um, the, the calendar year. Of, is it a 1231 year end or is it a, a different year end? But uh, for example, right now we're still rushing where uh, for some clients, we just started a, a project uh, 
uh, last week with uh, doing 2019 taxes. Um, you know, they have a September 15th deadline. And so, you know, at this time, we, we, we don't typically like to do projects this late in the year, but you know, what's unusual now with, uh, you know, with COVID uh, is that, you know, with our business, it's very important to, uh, to be there in person. But um, for the calculation of the credit, it's not necessary. So we're spending a lot of time doing interviews by telephone, interviews by Zoom. And, you know, we're, we're helping businesses now that are, uh, you know, that are filing their taxes here in a month and in a couple of days. And then once it's safe to travel again, we're coming in and we're doing the substantiation part. So uh, there's, two, there, there's two parts of a study. You know, one part is the calculation, which, um, you know, doesn't take an enormous amount of effort. Or, you know, it takes, you know, so, some time. But then we're going to come back and, and interview the people in person, see the documentation and, uh, and, and kick the tires, as it were, that, uh, you know, we, we typically spend one or two days on site with our clients. But... Uh, um, you know, it's uh, a lot of people are, you know, basically you have up until the end of your filing date, but, uh, you know, it takes us a couple of weeks to put things together. So we're still starting some projects right now for, for September 15th uh, deadline for, for 2019. But for 2020, it's, yeah, we've got plenty of time. Okay. Thank you, Tony. And one other thing, can you explain how you go in and initially do all of the uh, investigation, putting everything together, how that works going forward in terms of developing a process. Sure, sure. So uh, the way that a study works, there's, uh, there, there's the financial component where, um, where we send out a list of documents to, that we require for our clients. Um, basically, that's payroll information, uh, trial balances, uh, patent history, and uh, we then put together a framework for the project. And then once uh, a org chart, and once we have this framework together, we do the series of interviews. And we usually like to do this, you know, it's been by, by, by Zoom or conference call that, uh, you know, the best uh, scenario is uh, in a conference room. But we get together, uh, usually kind of the, the heads of, a, of uh, the, the head of engineering, head of sales, um, uh, if you've got a um, the CFO or controller, the plant manager, we kind of get a group of people around together, the C-level team, and do a kickoff meeting to kind of develop a baseline understanding of how the R&D flows within that particular organization. And then from there on, uh, we go and uh, we'll either interview groups of people. Sometimes all we need to do is interview one person in the team if they have a really good grasp of what everyone's doing. And, uh, and then, you know, usually we're, uh, I always want to say on site, even though it's, uh, it's been virtual a lot of late. Um, but, you know, we, we, we try to kind of get the, 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 the flow of everything done in one or two days, uh, interviewing the people. Uh, then we go back, we start tying things together. There's usually uh, one or two follow-up calls. There's, um, uh, there's uh, always someone ducking our meetings that we finally get through. And, uh, uh, and then we, have, uh, we roll out the surveys, which we have people take a one-page survey um, in, if, if it's necessary. There might be enough su support there from, from time tracking, but often we want to get this survey in as well. Uh, and then we tie everything together and we, sub, uh, we do, uh, we kind of spend 20 minutes or so going over everything on a high level. We prepare them the documentation that we send to their CPAs uh, and that's a two page, uh, two pages of instructions. The CPA puts it on their uh, return and, um, and, and we're good to go. Now, um, if uh, ever this happens, um, you know, if the company gets audited and someone wants to take a look from the IRS or state of Arizona at, uh, at their documentation, then we sit down and uh, we're the ones that uh, spend, whether it be uh, 10 hours or, or 30, and uh, go through with everything with the uh, taxing authorities. That, that part is, uh, you know, sometimes we'll need a little bit of, uh, of explanation from uh, from one of the engineers on this uh, on the client's team, but that's typically something that we do uh, face to face with or over the phone with uh, with the taxing authorities. So basically, the 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 bulk of the effort is that first year, 
And then in subsequent years, uh, we do everything off site. We, uh, we send um, uh, three emails uh, that one includes the surveys, the other two uh, um, is just kind of some guided project reporting that usually takes about an hour to an hour and a half uh, for someone in our clients to do. And then we're also every year getting the uh, uh, payroll information, the W-2 of the people involved in the, uh, in the R&D process. Okay, thanks. And then how long is the uh, engagement period? Uh, we engage with our clients for four years. And what we do uh, when we release the, 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 basically we're under contract, we're uh, creating our clients intellectual property. And what we want to do is we want to be with them through all open tax years. So for example, if we engage with the client in 2020, when we disengage with them in 2023, all of their open tax years are under our methodology. So uh, if they were ever audited, it's very defensible. So, um, and then when we release it, uh, the, the, the client runs with it. And, you know, uh, to, to be honest with you, uh, most of our clients uh, stay with us. They say, thank you, we're, uh, we're, we're you know, we're, we're not gonna pay anyone for, for any of this. And then, um, you know, come February of the year, they, they, they they call us and say, "Look, we really haven't been keeping up. Can you, can you, can you keep going with this?" So it's uh, we've we've got a lot of long term clients, and, and it all depends on you know some of our clients grow real fast, and um, they um, they end up you know it makes sense for them to hire someone at times in house to uh, just to take care of all this. Okay. And then a question here: um, How much do your services cost? And how does how does the payment work in terms of when when, when would they pay? Uh, so um, for us, uh, we do. There's no upfront fees, no hidden fees. Uh, we take a portion. We take uh, thirty five percent of the credit that we're able to uh, uh, to find for a client, uh, and then our costs are tax deductible also. So from a cash flow level, uh, cash flow basis. Um, if we find a client uh, uh, $100, they're keeping $80 of the benefit after they've paid, uh, uh, after they've paid us. So they're basically, it's basically it's kind of an 80-20 split. And then the other thing also is uh, we guarantee a cash flow positive engagement for our clients. So uh, we have the option if for some reason, uh, you know, maybe they buy a large piece of equipment and uh, that offsets their taxes or, or God forbid, a pandemic comes around and changes our economy and that offsets their taxes and they're not, uh, not owing taxes on a given year, these tax credits carry forward 20 years, we'll say, you don't have to pay us until you use these tax credits sometime in the future. So that way it's always, you know, they're not paying something, paying us for something that they're not using. And that also makes sense for, for startups and such if they're not gonna use the credits right away. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, and then how about, um, you, you mentioned carrying forward. What about going back in past years and, and capturing missed opportunities for our new sure. So uh, the credits also carry back one year, so you could use them for, for past years. But um, what you're talking about, I think, is um, amending returns. Correct. What, uh, you know, what, uh, we do that. We, uh, we, uh, we never, uh, you know, we never, uh, I should say, we never force a client to do that. What we do is, uh, as part of the study, we will let a client know, here are what your potential benefits would have been if you, or would be, if you amend returns and claim these credits. We also share with them the risks. Um, for example, we might say, well, look, uh, uh, if you, um, you know, it, you can amend 20, 2019, and 18, but in 17, well, some of your key people are gone. It'd be really hard to defend this. We wouldn't advise you to do that. We also share with them the, that on a go forward basis, uh, the, uh, the, there's no increase in audit risk, uh, in, in audit rate. This is just a two page form on your tax return, gets read by a computer just like the rest of it. Going back, when you're amending returns, uh, your it gets sent to a special office for human review, and about half of our clients that choose to amend their returns get audited. So it is an increase in audit rate. 
Um, that said, most of the clients that choose to amend tend to have pretty substantial tax credits. Uh, but what's happening right now is people are looking at their businesses and they're looking at the climates and more and more of our clients recently, uh, in just in this last year, are, are they're saying, well, geez, my business has slowed down. If ever I have time for an audit, this is the time to do it. And more and more of our clients are choosing to, uh, to take that risk and, and amend returns, even though it's, you know, it has to be, most of our clients still, they just choose to do this on a go forward basis. But yeah, the fact is, yes, you can go back uh, three years through open tax statute and, and, and potentially get money back from overpayments. And uh, that's more attractive now with that CARES Act, uh, as I mentioned, where you're also going to go back and, uh, and amend uh, past years and, and actually be able to open up two years proceeding if you've not claimed that uh, the r and tax credit before. So more, yeah, that's... Uh, it, it, it's something that, you know, it's, uh, it's important to note that there, there's, uh, you know, we've seen companies out there that, that really kind of want to, you know, get clients to amend, but it is certainly, it's a client's choice. There, there's, there's risks and reward that come with it. Sounds good. I'm not seeing any other questions right now. Um, so, um, you know, let, oh, let me uh, let, let me kind of go through some of these questions here that uh, that I do have since we have a few minutes. Okay. Um, and these are you know I mentioned earlier the uh, the four rules that uh, uh, you know the, the the four things that kind of need to fit in order to an activity to be qualified. But uh, yeah, here's the kind of the questions that a business owner might be asked. Do you want to go back to your screen there? No. Oh, am I not sharing my screen? Um, I I switched it there. Oh, okay. So, yeah, please. Uh, if, you wanna, if you wanna go back and pull those questions back up. Okay, let's see. Oh, okay, let me see how to do this. Share screen. There we go. Is that, can you see it? There we go, yep, got it. Fantastic. So uh, one thing, if, if your business is um, filing a patent, not a trademark, you mind you, but a patent, that's proof positive that R&D is occurring. So. Definitely, you know, if there's uh, patents going on, you have R&D, you have qualifying activities. These are the kind of questions you would ask, you know, what kind of, uh, what were the results? What kind of documentations do I have? Did we seek different alternatives? These are all kind of questions that, you know, the how to can we, as I said. Um, what was known at the start? What wasn't known? What did we learn? What kind of new functionalities, capabilities, enhancements came as a result of our effort? Uh, is this something that's freely available to the public or not? Uh, one of the questions that we get asked also is, uh, oh, I bought this piece of software. Does that qualify? Unfortunately not. The R&D tax credit came to the people, the Microsofts, the uh, the, the companies that, uh, that created the software. If you're creating software in-house, there's portions of that that will likely qualify. If you're buying it off the shelf, it will not. So internal use software is something that um, needs to be bifurcated now. Uh, basically, um, it's stuff that uh, a, lot of, a lot of businesses, uh, SaaS companies, uh, for example, they'll have customer-facing software uh, it's something that a customer can log in on and that portion of the software will qualify. But the stuff that's going on internally, uh, whether it be Am you know, Amazon doing inventory of goods or deliveries, uh, banking transactions, these kinds of things won't qualify. So the important thing with software is to bifurcate it, to make sure that the costs that qualify get captured and the costs that, costs that don't qualify are also noted but aren't captured for the credit. Um, so, um, software that you're making, developing for license, the apps that you might be using as part of your business to enhance it, uh, so for advertisement, these types of software, embedded software, CNC programming, these are also qualifying costs. So, um, we often get questions, um, with, uh, with ERP systems, um, 
ERP systems, typically uh, you're going to buy it off the shelf. That won't qualify. Sometimes you'll spend $50,000 to buy the software and then $100,000 to get it to work right. Depending on the complexity, we've seen circumstances where some of those added costs will qualify. Um, usually they do not. And those are, those are kind of the kind of, yeah, those are the last questions, the last slides that I had on there. So if you want to take back the screen. Okay. There, Jim. But uh, yeah, um, I've left uh, you know, some of those. Uh, and, and I think uh, uh, we'll be publishing slides of this. So is that right? Yeah, we're recording this. So it'll be available to, for, for anyone who wants to go back and review. I might also send you some slides. Uh, so it might be easier for someone, but. Uh, okay. You know, yeah, so, so I, I think the most important thing to note, it, it might be a good idea if, if anyone thinks this might be a good fit just to have a, you know, 30 minute conversation with, with you on the phone and, yeah. and kind of get the specifics of their organization and see if it makes sense. Yeah. And, and there's, you know, there's two things here. The, you know, certainly um, uh, I, I'd love to, 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 to have all clients say, yes, I need a study. But uh, the, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, uh, you lo looking at the participant list, uh, there's a couple of businesses uh, that uh, I think we'd be able to help out just, uh, just by sitting down with them. And I'd be more than happy to do that um, and, and point them in the right direction and um, you know, make sure that they're claiming, uh, you know, some of them might just have you know, five or $10,000 to claim. I'd, I'd much rather have that say, stay in the state of Arizona than, uh, than go to Washington, D.C. at present. We appreciate that, Tony. I know you've offered to do that for a few of our smaller clients, so that's fantastic. So with that, if there's no more questions, um, I just want to thank everybody for joining us today, and we'll be sending out a very brief Survey Monkey survey just so you can give us some feedback on how you think this went um, so that it can help us improve future webinars. I certainly appreciate that, too. Thanks again, Tony. Thank you all for joining us. Oh, wait, we might have another question here. Okay. Should we contact our consultant or Tony directly? Um, if, if you're already engaged with Tony, um, Beth, I think you, you and Tony have already done some work. I think that's fine. Just, I mean, it's good for, for Rodney, your advisor, to be involved. Um, if, you, if, if you haven't worked with us yet, or if you, haven't, if you know who your advisor is, just contact your advisor and we can get something on the calendar for, for you, make it a lot easier for you. Thank you so much, Jim. I appreciate the opportunity. All right. Sounds yeah. good. Thank you, Tony, and, and safe travels out there. All right. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.